here in the Graceland archives. And a very interesting fact that many, not many people know is that Elvis was an avid reader. We have over 600 books in the collection and Elvis always carried books off the road with him to read between shows. I have a few pulled out here that are just examples of some of the books Elvis would have read. And another note that you'll see, especially in this book here, that Elvis, when he found passages that he was passionate about, would actually underline them so that he could go back and read them again. We really hope that you guys are safe, having fun, and we're going to see you guys here in Memphis real soon at Graceland. Hi, my name is Nicole Robinson Hamilton, and I'd like to welcome you to the Southern Festival of Books based here in Nashville, Tennessee, but broadcasting to the world. The Southern Festival of Books is presented for free from the Humanities Tennessee and our key sponsors, Metro Nashville Arts Commission, Ingram Content Group, Tennessee Arts Commission, Vanderbilt University, and Parnassus Books. The festival is a free nonprofit event that is also supported in part by donations from individuals. So if you appreciate the event and want to support it, you can do so by visiting our website at humanitiestennessee.org. There should also be a link to donate on this page as well. And by buying the featured books from Parnassus Books, our local book selling partner. Purchases of festival featured books via Parnassus helps to keep the festival free. Look for the buy link somewhere on this chat. This session is called Wild Wild Nature, Three Explorations with Rob Sinbeck, Michael Ray Taylor, and Ted Williams. You're welcome to ask questions during this session via Facebook and the Southern Festival app. So to start, I'm going to introduce each book and author. We're going to start with Rob Sinbeck. Rob Sinbeck is the author of The Southern Life Watcher, Notes of a Naturalist. Rob has written for The Washington Post, Guidepost, Field and Stream, Birders World, Wild Birds, Wildlife Conservation Magazines for 20 years. He is an author, a ghostwriter, and editor to more than 20 books, and is the former president and chairman of the Southeastern Outdoor Press Association. Our second book and author, is Hidden Nature, Wild Southern Caves, written by Michael Ray Taylor, Professor of Communications, Chair of Communications and Theater Department at Henderson State University in Arkansas. He's the author of several books, including Cave Passages, Dark Life, and Caves, as well as articles in Sports Illustrated, New York Times, Houston Chronicle, Wired, and Audubon. And thirdly, Earth Almanac by Ted Williams. A year of witnessing the wild from the call of the loon to the journey of the gray whale. Ted writes full time on fish and wildlife issues in monthly a monthly recovery column for the National Nature Conservatory Cool Green Science in various other publications. A longtime contributor to Audubon Magazine, Williams was recognized by the Outdoor Writer Association of America as the nation's best outdoorist and has received numerous other National Writing Conservation Awards. Welcome. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you very much. Good to be here. So I would like to start with Rob, because it's easier when we have multiple people to start in alphabetical order. Um, Rob, just tell us a little bit about your book and, and why you're here today. Um, it, well, first of all, it's really an honor to be here with Ted and Michael. Their books uh, are terrific, and we all share the wonder of what's out there in terms of both critters and the environment that they uh, inhabit. I have been a writer pretty much all my life. It started before I was a teenager 
I had my first grad school for me was a daily newspaper where I was a general assignment reporter and covered everything. So I learned how to find information in those days with just a telephone and a typewriter and then put together the most coherent thing I could <laughs> quickly to a given length. And then the next day, everyone in town would yell at me if I got it wrong. So I learned how to be fast and accurate. Over the years, um, I wanted my love of nature to show up in what I did. I was in the music industry for a long time and wrote a lot about it. And I started writing for state wildlife magazines, starting here in Tennessee, where I live. And I was writing for about 20 of them. One of them was South Carolina Wildlife. And the editor at the time, Linda Renshaw, said, Rob, I've got an idea for a column. I would like somebody to take one animal, every issue, talk personally about it, tell anecdotes, something to hold readers, and then bring in all the scientific data. Give us a good, solid natural history, 1,200 words. What do you think? And I was all for anything that would get me a column six times a year with that magazine. Uh, any good freelance writer wants something steady like that. And so I started back in 1994. And over the years, I've done probably 170 of them. Wow. And then a couple of years ago, I started talking to South Car University of South Carolina Press. And I said, would you be interested in this collected as a book? And they got excited about it. And so we pulled together 36 pieces, 12 land, 12 water, 12 air. I had not as primal and basic a division as that is, I hadn't seen it done before. The air, just to give you four or five of them, American crow, monarch butterfly, housefly, eastern screech owl, <laughs> luna moth, American robin, carpenter bee, some of the 12. On land, eastern gray squirrel, wolf spider, black rat snake, red fox, eastern mole, copperhead, bobcat, and earthworm. And water, bullfrog, shrimp, loggerhead sea turtle, crayfish, starfish, Atlantic and Gulf sturgeon, manatee, and striped bass. Wow. And that's the way we divided it. And so what I did was I would rack my brain, go back to my childhood, take the things that excited me about it. Most writing is just, hey, gang, look what I saw. Look what I've been through. That's most interesting writing. And it, I mean, just the, the way communication started around campfires. That's what I aspire to do. And so I would start there. And then I talk to at least one expert for each piece so that there is someone who works as a biologist um, for one of the agencies, uh, for one of the universities, and has expertise. So there's that combination. And I may as well just do a really quick um, reading of the opening of one of them because it's it shows the combination of the personal and the informational that I hoped to do with this. This is the opening of the ruby-throated hummingbird chapter. Sit here on the porch, Debbie said one Sunday afternoon in early summer. I want to show you my hummingbirds. We had just started dating, and I had come to visit her at her little white house in the country. She picked up something that looked like an hourglass with several tiny red saxophones sticking out the bottom. I soon learned it was a hummingbird feeder, but my knowledge of flora, fauna, and their associated hardware was so rudimentary at the time that I had no idea. She walked a few paces into the yard and stood holding the gadget about a foot in front of her face, which wore a look of determined expectation. She stood this way for several minutes, her arm crooked at a 45 degree angle, until I began to believe the hummingbirds might be imaginary and that I should start tiptoeing toward my car. <laughs> Soon, though, something that sounded like a tiny atomic cat purring zipped across my field of vision. It stopped a few feet from her in the feeder, hanging in midair like a battery operated Christmas ornament. Its body angled kind of like the Concord. It eyed her, eyed the feeder, and moved in for a drink. Debbie lit up like she'd just been named Miss America, and I have to admit, I was pretty impressed too. The thing had a black throat, or at least it looked black until the sun caught it just right, when it glowed like bright red coals. Its back was a nearly as pretty iridescent green. It was feeding inches from Debbie's face. Soon it was joined by another, this one with a white throat, which moved in for its own drink. They buzzed back and forth, drinking for a bit, zipping off to the edge of the woods, then coming back for about 10 minutes until Debbie's arm finally gave out. She came back to me and smiled. Pretty good, huh? She said. It was. 
It really was. And so that's the way I try to open these. Everything from a friend who got bit by a copperhead. And if you're going to get bit by a snake, by the way, a copperhead's the, a poisonous one. A copperhead's the one to get bit by. Okay. Um, a size, amount of poison, all that stuff. Um, and then, um, and for the coyote, I got to write about one of my favorite episodes of The Simpsons, where Homer eats this psychedelic uh, pepper and hallucinates Johnny Cash as the voice of a coyote spirit guide. And so all the way through here, what I'm trying to do is just share the magic that I've felt for so long about every critter. And it goes from bald eagles to house flies. It's, yeah. I want us to appreciate everything. Um, and I, I touch only briefly, and in Ted's book, he talks about the fact that if you make a book like this, sort of all lecture about responsibility and, and the role humans have played in um, what is now the sixth extinction, mm -hmm. you tend to lose people. And in here, I want just the sense of wonder that can go in every direction to, to really form the bond between me and, and readers. Yeah. Um, we share a gorgeous little planet with millions and millions of individual creatures. And this is just a way to look at 36 of them and say, hey, look what I saw. Wow. That's what we're trying to do here. So thank you so much, Nicole. Oh, wow. That sounds amazing. I love it. I love it. Michael, I know your book is also very personal. Tell us a little bit about it. Sure. And and uh, thanks, Nicole, again, for letting us be here. And thanks to Humanities Tennessee for sponsoring this great festival. I've been going in person for years and I'm sad I can't do that this year. But um, I love something Rob said just now. I think I, I, I've read both of these guys. They're wonderful natural nature writers. And, and uh, I, I think all three of us are doing what Rob's talking about. Hey, guys, guess what I saw? Um, you know, the things that thrill us because they thrill us are going to thrill readers who encounter them. And, you know, caves are, 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 are a part of nature, but they're sort of an obscure corner of nature. A lot of people don't think about. As an aside, let me say that many of the longtime cavers I know uh, you can't help but become a bit of an armchair naturalist because leaving aside the life you encounter within the cave, generally speaking in the South, you're doing a nice long hike through the woods somewhere up a mountain uh, to get to the cave. And I know people who are experts in ferns, a lot of cave entrances, especially in the Southeast, uh, host unusual ferns that are found nowhere else. And so people start studying ferns and become wild about the ferns or the other wildlife in the cave entrance area, uh, the insects, uh, the little critters and, and that sort of thing. So, but in my case, uh, as I write in the book, uh, I grew up in Florida, which is a wonderful natural place. And I spent a lot of time as a kid out in the waterways and, and woods of Florida, but all of it geology is well below the water table. It's a kind of a flat sandy place. And so when my family would travel to visit relatives in the Midwest and we drive through northern Alabama, Tennessee, places like that, I was fascinated just with actual mountains, which I only knew from movies and storybooks. And when I learned that there were these secret underground places in them, I became even more fascinated and eventually uh, uh, persuaded my parents to take me to a couple of tour caves. And then I didn't think much about caves again until I went to college at Florida State where I learned that there are actually many uh, wild caves above the water table in the elevated lands of the Florida Panhandle, several hundred. And the cavers in this group were exploring and mapping some of these caves that had never been entered before. And so here's a chance in a highly populated city in a highly populated state for me as a 19-year-old college student to go with people who are seeing things occasionally at least, that no human eyes have ever seen. Wow. And how cool was that? So mm -hmm. I was just immediately drawn into it. And um, uh, at the time I started, this is in 1979, um, caving, unbeknownst to me, I was just lucky to be beginning to cave at a time when there was this golden age of exploration, discovery, not only in the South, but really throughout the world. 
caves had new technology, new types of ropes and vertical gear to descend pits that no one had ever been into before, uh, better mapping technologies to figure out where the next passage would be. And there was new discovery everywhere and it's still going on. In the state of Tennessee, there's now over 10,000 mapped caves and new caves were added to the list every year. And so the group in Florida would start driving up to go caving in Tennessee, northern Alabama, north Georgia, an area called TAG by cavers, and I fell in love with it. Uh, and at the same time, I learned a lot about the nature of the caves, the natural history, and ways that caves can be a bellwether for what's going on in the natural world on the surface. I mean, we're all familiar with the stories of coal miners who would carry a canary into the mine, and if the canary died, then that meant the air was bad in the mine. Well, caves are an important part of the water flow uh, that serves the surface and can tell you a lot about the health of the life on the surface. And there's sort of a receptacle of climate history and history of pollution and things like that. So uh, cavers instantly, you know, you do it for a year and you become a conservationist, whether you ever intended to or not because caves are so delicate. And we know that we're interlopers every time we go into them. We know that we can, with a casual flick of the hand, destroy a formation that took 10,000 years to grow, or by shining our light on a hibernating bat, we can wake that bat up and it won't have fat reserves to make it through the winter and it'll fall off and die right after I leave the cave. And so you feel a certain responsibility to, to, to cave softly. Anyone who goes in the woods feels that responsibility, but I think caves amplify it a little bit. Um, since we have about 10 minutes each, I'm going to do like Rob and read a very short passage that just gives a sense of that mixture of wonder and study and science. Um, in this book, you know, in part, it's a very personal book. It's sort of a, a love letter to tag Tennessee, Alabama, Georgia, and some of the surrounding states uh, where I've been living the last 40 years. But I also profile some of the better known, um, more respected papers in these areas. And one of these guys, a uh, fellow who's still going at it in his late 70s, is Marion O. Smith, a legend among tag cavers. And in the late 90s, he found this marvelous 15-mile uh, cave system that's being still parts of it uh, explored in the last few years in Tennessee. And in the center of this cave is a ledge. And across that ledge is a drop of uh, a couple hundred feet into a room that, as I wrote for Sports Illustrated, you could easily fit the Louisiana Superdome inside this room and it wouldn't touch the walls or ceiling. Uh, so this was my first experience of entering that room with Marion Smith and some of the original explorers. At first, only view was colored bands of rock on the nearest wall and the tiny twinkling lights of cavers 20 stories below. They appeared to spin slowly as the rope twisted under my weight. Because two of the most famous pits in TAG are named Fantastic and Incredible, Marion decided to name this drop Stupendous Pit. From where I sat, the name fit. The far wall and most of the room were lost in darkness. I had heard that the rumble room was unusually black, not only because of its size, but because of suspended dust. Looking around me, I saw that was not exactly the case. What surrounded me appeared to be millions of tiny, discrete water droplets floating in air. They undulated in waves reflected by the, lamp of my, the light of my helmet lamp, like phosphorescent beads within the body of some monstrous jellyfish. I wonder what sort of microbial ecosystem might be hovering about me. Although blind fish, cave crayfish, and other endangered species had been found living in the river far below, I knew that no microbiologist had yet entered this cave, and to my knowledge, that does remain the fact to date. While Rumbling Falls exploration appeared to be winding down, the scientific study there had barely begun. Not for the first time, I marveled that the state of Tennessee came within a hair's breadth of dumping millions of gallons of treated effluent into this hidden wonderland. Mm. Because this cave, at the same time it was being explored, was going to be the receptacle of a new sewage treatment plant for the town of Spencer, Tennessee. And so the cavers united, uh, even before they, uh, Marion and his team were keeping the cave a secret as they mapped it, but because there are so many caves and so much uh, the rich limestone karst that 
harbors caves in this area. Cavers had already begun uh, fighting to move this sewage plant to another location, but the fight became more urgent when this particular cave was revealed. So there's a lot of uh, conservation elements to this story. There's a lot of science to the story. There's some archaeology. I, I, I write with wonder about a cave where only the forbearance of explorers and a little bit of plastic flagging keep people from stepping on these footprints in a muddy passage where every step leaves a muddy footprint. There are some footprints that were left 4,500 years ago wow. by Native American explorers and bits of ash that dropped off their torches. And they're preserved because this is an undisturbed passage in a cave. And the explorers recognized that and, and mapped a path whereby you can look at this without touching or interfering with it. And, you know, like I say, caves, caves live uh, in what people have more recently begun calling deep time. You, you're touching a geological time or a deep cultural period every time you go into one. And so it makes you contemplate personally your short, your short while to have fun on this earth. But as a culture, all the things we've done in the last hundred years on this earth to the planet and the things we need to do to protect it. And that's really part of what, uh, you know, my message is my own personal love for the sport, how it's changed my life and the lives mm -hmm. of my friends, mm -hmm. but also why caves are important to people, even if they never really want to go in one, except perhaps a tour cave on vacation sometimes. <laughs> so that's, that's it in a nutshell. Wow. I, I don't think I've ever made quite those connections in thinking about caves until you started talking. So I really appreciate that. So we've, we've talked about some animals and some creatures above and around and in the air. Now we've talked about caves. Now it's Ted's turn. So Ted is going to tell us about the seasons. Yes. Well, uh, I wanted to do a, a book that was a little different than uh, my column in, in Audubon. Um, for years, I wrote a column called Insight, which was feature length, and it uh, was muckraking, a call to action. It needed to be said that it was, it was a, too much of that was a prescription for burnout. I wanted to do a reprieve and something uh, uh, more fun. Um, so I, I was assigned the same magazine, a column originally called Earth Calendar. It morphed into Earth Almanac. The frustrating thing about it was that I had to cut a lot of copy to fit two-page spread. So in this book, I've restored all the cut copy. And um, I, my, my mission was to, um, to, to get people to get outside, even in their backyards, and notice things, the magic and beauty of nature that they normally would overlook. Um, and... I tried not to to have any calls for action or anything like that. I wanted to get them aware of the magic and beauty of nature. And then I think the advocacy would come later. That was my mission. Mm -hmm. So um, maybe I should uh, just read a little short essay of, that I explained it better than I am now in the book. I am convinced that these regular retreats into what is pure and clean and right for the world have made me a better environmental reporter because they have reminded me of what's at stake and what I'm fighting for. Mm -hmm. They also have reminded me that the crusade for healthy native ecosystems is far from hopeless and that good news abounds. As you read this book, pay careful attention to many species that have recovered from desperate trouble to continue to do well or at least hold their own in a world in which the general assumption is that everything has gone to hell. Mm -hmm. Even now, as I reread the manuscript, I find good news remarkable and uplifting. These victories are more than isolated events. They result from new ways of thinking and new ways of responding to wildlife emergencies. Together, they prove that humans can undo damage they've done and restore the planet. What's more, they indicate that humans can yet prove themselves to be a successful species by living in harmony with their own habitat and with other life forms. Mm. Maybe if we can save gray whales and striped bass, we can save ourselves. 
I like to think that Earth Almanac has helped bring a balance to all my writing. And I hope that it has provided, and will continue to provide sustenance to a campaign I've been part of since 1970 that I now believe we will win. When I, in 1970, I went to work for the Massachusetts Division of Fisheries and Wildlife as their wildlife journalist. And I'm old enough to remember how grim things were back then. We didn't have an environmental policy act. We didn't have an Endangered Species Act. We didn't have a Clean Water Act or a Clean Air Act. DDT was being sprayed all over the planet. Um, I had not seen a bluebird until I was 21. Mm. Today, there are bluebirds everywhere because of we've banned DDT and everybody has been putting up bluebird boxes. Uh, in our field in Grafton, Massachusetts, we, we generally fledge two or three broods of bluebirds a year. They change in their habits. They stay all winter now, along with the robins, and eat winterberries and mealworms that we put out for them. Uh, back then, we never saw a loon on our lake in New Hampshire where we had a camp. Now there are always three or four loons in the lake. They bring off a couple chicks every year. Never saw an eagle. There were no eagles in Massachusetts. Now we have breeding uh, eagles about uh, a dozen locations. In our lake in New Hampshire, you can, hardly can go out there uh, on a week without seeing a couple eagles. Same with ospreys. So things are, are, are not as bad as, as they were. Good news tends not to get reported. Mm. The environmental groups, um, and I, I don't begrudge them for this, but they need to do fundraising. Mm -hmm. so they have to concentrate on the things that need to be fixed, which is right. fine. We also need to report the good news or we're get, you know, impose a feeling of, of hopelessness. Mm. Also in the book, I wanted to uh, do it by seasons so that right, right now in the fall, what can you go out in your backyard mm -hmm. or even the nearby lot and field and, and see now that maybe you didn't notice before? Mm -hmm. um, and I'll just read a quick little essay on that. While not immune to spring-induced giddiness, members of the Williams family are far more afflicted with a previously undescribed malady called fall fever. We feel the first symptoms on those crisp mornings just prior to the autumnal equinox when morning glories open on the lattice work along the south garden wall, when our lake falls silent save for the lapping of waves and the gabbling of northern ducks, when aspens and tamaracks go smoky gold Swamp maples blaze, and the azure sky is one shade richer than at any other time of year. Fall brings the fragrance of wood smoke and leaf smoke, sweet rotten scent of frost killed ferns and deer bitten apples, young grouse and the touch me nots, woodcocks fluttering moth like in the bare alderons at dusk, wild geese barking as if from treetop level, yet so high they look like ribbons of crate tack across the corners of the Crescent moon. As Joni Mitchell and our friend Tom Rush sing, they've got the urge for going and they've got the wings to go. Mm -hmm. Migrations of geese and other waterfowl are noticed by most people, even those generally oblivious to other natural world sites. But the greatest migration on Earth passes pass unseen by all but a few hundred thousand Americans. They happen not with mammals on old world steps or savannas, or even birds along busy flyways, with sea creatures underwater along our west and east coasts. Another thing I wanted to do in the, in the book is, is, um, is get into why animals play. And scientific uh, explanations for this have struck me as, as uh, invalid. Um, mm. The claim always that it's a preparation for, for, for fighting later on defensive territories. Some of that is, is perhaps true. Um, but there are other reasons uh, for the play that don't get reported. And humans and wildlife, particularly our fellow mammals, are not so dissimilar as we like to suppose. We share many characteristics to play, for example, 
Biologists have proclaimed that playfulness in wild canids, ungulates, bears, cats, mustelids, and rodents is merely practice for serious adult activity, such as battles over territory or social hierarchy. This may be true, but from my observations in the wild, I have no doubt that sometimes playfulness is just playfulness. That is, wild animals like humans play to have fun. <laughs> Consider the essay Winter Games, in which I was following. An otter will pluck a pebble from the bottom of a river or lake, surface with it, drop it, swim under it, catch it on its fire, slip and turn back to the surface with the pebble still in place, and start the game anew. Now, what useful activity could otters possibly be practicing in this game? Swimming agility? I doubt it. They need this exercise about as much as professional baseball players need t-ball sets. Otters, like lots of other creatures, including us, simply enjoy sport. Mm. To deny this fact is not only unscientific, it diminishes wildlife and the wonder of nature. I love that. I love that all of you are looking to help spark joy and excitement and to bring good news. Because I, I agree with you, Ted. It feels like so much is just negative and heavy. But being in contact with sparks that joy uh, brings people and keeps people, which you know makes me think about the whole uh, COVID. Um, I mentioned earlier that I'm a member of the Nashville chapter of Outdoor Afro, and I've been for a few years. What we've noticed, especially in March, is an uptake of people getting outside more, trying to learn more about nature, going hiking, going kayaking and exploring. So as my experts for, for our newbies, what would you all suggest as ways for people to just take those tentative steps out into the outdoors? We'll start back with you, Rob. I'd say start start with your window in your yard. There, there are plenty of people who don't get very far, but there is much to appreciate in even the most um, uh, urban yard. We can start with what has adapted to us um, in cities and what is adapting more to us. People are seeing more foxes and coyotes and things like that yeah. in, in, in moved from the country to the suburbs to the cities. Um, and especially now with fewer people out, there are many reports of, of wild animals getting uh, braver and braver. Um, to, to get a little field guide, the, the most basic field guide to birds, the child's introduction is enough to get us started on the usual suspects that will come to a feeder and you'll see them in the yard and on the wires and just to recognize their names, especially if you've got children around, it is almost impossible not to interest a child uh, in things in the outdoors. Mm -hmm. And and then you take it to the, the nearby parks where you'll probably see a, a wider variety. One of the heartening things about this tough time we're going through is that uh, state and national parks are getting an influx of people who are looking to spend time um, mm -hmm. in nature. We, we all came out of this dirt. A human egg is a recipe for taking water and the food your mother eats and turning them into you. That's what a human egg is, it's just a recipe. We came out of the dirt because everything our mamas eat has, is connected to the dirt one way or another. So did all these other creatures. We are connected by DNA, the language of how we're all constructed. And to recognize in something as humble as the flyer of the earthworm or something as majestic as a bobcat or a bald eagle, um, that there is kinship and there is much to be excited about and respectful of, I think is a great pastime. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. I love starting simple. What about you? Well, um, I'll first echo what Rob said about your own backyard. Actually, Rob and I are, are lucky in that we both happen to be friends with a brilliant writer. And I'm going to go ahead and give her a plug while I'm here. Margaret Rinkle, uh, who wrote this book, Late My Day. Yeah columnist for the New York Times. And uh, she gets upset when she's a naturalist because she says she's just someone who looks out her window in the yard and finds nature there. And she has some wonderful essays, they're both personal essays about her life, but also about, about seeking solace in nature. 
And she truly is what I would call a backyard naturalist, even though she bristles at, at, at the line. Um, but for my little corner of nature, caves, um, there, there are many ways you can get introduced. Uh, just as the state and national parks are opening, uh, that uh, some of which were closed early in the pandemic, many commercial caves, and caves that are operated by state and national parks, have reopened not only to lighted tours, which are you know a, a, a safe and an unmuddy way to see a cave, but many of the commercial caves and the the uh, uh, publicly owned tour caves offer what they call uh, wild caving experiences or spelunking tours. And these are a chance to experience the cave as original explorers do. You know, you, you're issued a helmet and lamp, uh, some boots, you bring some boots, some gloves, and you're going to forever trash whatever clothing you wear into the cave, <laughs> but you'll be moving in the three dimensional base that is the cave and seeing it to see whether or not cave exploration is something, you know, for you. There's also a, a wonderful national organization called the National Speleological Society, which is hard enough to spell that I won't try for people Googling it. But they, their website is easy, it's caves.org. And if you look them up, they have local chapters uh, in, in many places, especially cave rich areas. There are many, uh, the clubs are called grottos. There are many grottos of the NSS in the state of Tennessee, for example, and all of them offer occasional novice trips where uh, you can join the group. And of course, it's harder to do trips now, but it's not impossible. Uh, you know, there, there are people going back to the caves again. The hard part's getting there. You've got to drive your car. You've got to eat at restaurants along the way. Uh, you've got to encounter people. But once you get out in the woods on the trail to the cave, that's the last place where you're likely to get COVID in, unless you're bringing it there and you want to make sure you don't share it with anybody who are, who's with you. Um, one caveat about going caving right now, we're entering the fall. And as I write about in the book, there's and, I, and these fellows I think have also written about, there's this devastating disease called white nose syndrome that mm -hmm. since 2006 has been spreading through the Appalachians and slowly moving west. And it's killed many species of bats and they're slowly making a recovery in some areas. But one of the things a lot of uh, areas have done are closed caves to exploration during hibernation season. So you'd have to check if you're going to visit a local cave, whether whether a wild one or a commercial one, if it's open to exploration or not. But having said that, there are many caves that remain open year round. And I'd encourage anyone who thinks they might like it to, uh, to try it out. Cavers are an odd lot. But, um, you know, the first time you crawl, slither through a nasty, muddy hole and pop out in a big room, uh, you're either going to hold it forever or you're going to be hooked forever. One or the other. <laughs> I love that. What about you, Ted? Well, uh, as Rob said, get, a, get some field guides. Uh, mm -hmm. Get a bird book, uh, several of them. When you go to walk, bring some binoculars. Um, also look for, for butterflies. Um, it's a great book yeah. called Butterflies and Binoculars by Jeff Glasper. So you can identify butterflies. Uh, and, and don't stop going out in the winter because everybody thinks that winter is dead, and it's not. There's a lot going on in winter, including butterflies. A lot of butterflies that will fly around on you know, a fairly warm day in winter. Uh, how do they hatch? Well, they don't. They, they hibernate. Huh. Question marks, comma, morning quotes. Um, look for um, springtails, ancient insect, 300 million years old, that live in the snow and fairly warm winter days. They'll, they'll come up, you know, graze in the algae on top of the snow. They're about a little bigger than a grain of pepper. And if you look carefully, they jump. That's why they're called springtails. Look for these things. Um, the COVID has indeed helped wildlife in many ways. I had a little piece of Reader's Digest about um, sea turtles. You have huge nesting of sea turtles on beaches that have been abandoned by humans. Mm. So we've got a big pulse of young sea turtles going back into the, the ocean. Um, go fishing. Um, if you go fishing, you learn. There's a lot of things out there to notice that are, don't have to do with fish. Because throughout have a lot of people fish all their lives without realizing 
fish is the fish is not what they're seeking. They're seeking something else. Um, put up birdhouses. We have about a dozen birdhouses in our field, and as I mentioned, bluebirds are doing really well, and so are tree swallows because of the boxes. Mm -hmm. Bluebird holes in the boxes are small enough to exclude the alien starlings from Europe, which were one reason the bluebirds fell off. And the tree swallows can get in there now. And so they're doing really well too. But it's two for one. Um, we, we put up a, a gourd right where we sit in the, in the terrace uh, and a little hole. And we have great fun watching the Jenny Wren come in and out, feeding her babies. She, <laughs> she fought off two bulls. Um, that's what the Indians used to do. Uh, the Indians had only one reason for putting up gourds like to see birds. Um, put up bat houses. As Michael mentioned, um, um, bat, bats have been hurting from white nose syndrome, but some of the good news that doesn't get reported is that uh, they're slowly developing an immunity. I have a good friend who nice. studies white nose uh, syndrome. And, and, uh, we're seeing this year we saw a lot more bats in our, our property. That's yep. kind of cool. But um, Nature has a way of, of healing with us and healing itself. Yeah. Um, plant a butterfly garden. And it, our garden has mostly flowers and plants that, that serve as nectaring sources for adult butterflies and food sources for larval butterflies. So we see all kinds of good butterflies, several butterflies that we haven't seen south here. Mm -hmm. Probably through climate change. Um, great, um, great swallowtails, giant swallowtails. Wow. So, uh, there are a few things you can do. And yeah. don't, again, don't get uh, inbound in the winter. Get out there. Yeah. No such thing as bad weather, only bad clothing. I 100% agree with that. I say that all the time to people, all the time. I love that. So I have a, an audience question for Michael. The question is, what do you need to go on a novice uh, camp, uh, caving trip? Well, the single most important thing on your first trip is is uh, a guide, somebody who knows the ways, who, who, I like who that. has been there before and won't get you off and knows what they're doing. Uh, I'm going to answer that. But first, I want to add to what Ted said. Uh, two great reasons everybody should have a bat house in their backyard is most southeastern bats go out every night in the summer and consume mosquitoes. And that's a good thing for most people if you would like enjoying your yard. And if, when they consume the mosquitoes, uh, the bat guano begins to pile up beneath the bat, bat box. And there's nothing on this earth better for your tomatoes and other flowering plants and a little bit of bat guano as fertilizer. Um, but for, for novice, that's one reason I recommend uh, caves.org, the, the National Speleological Society, because most organizations maintain a closet of novice gear. You always want a helmet on your head, not so much to protect you from falling rocks, but because many times in caves you're stupid, you're four or five feet tall, and if you don't look out, you knock your head in the ceiling. And if you don't have a helmet, then you're going to the hospital for stitches. Uh, and you need a lamp on that head. Uh, you can't carry flashlights because you're using your hands all the time with gloves on um, to, uh, you know, help you negotiate slide up climbs, slide down climbs, crawling three-dimensional space that is a cave. And so you want to have the light on your head with you. And most commercial flashlights, I mean, they've gotten so much better in the years I've been caving, but even so, you can't really rely on them as well as lamps that are made specifically for caving. Those are the two main things, good shoes, which is true anywhere you're going into nature, whether underground or above ground. Um, but uh, that's also a, a good a good reason to try it the first time on one of these commercial uh, wild caving trips. Uh, at a state or national park or with a commercial ca uh, cave because they'll have all the gear that you need. Right. And, um, you know, a lot of people just never knew they were claustrophobic until that first trip. So at least you'll be in a, <laughs> a controlled environment when you find out. Um, but, uh, you know, and, and obviously the more advanced you get, the more gear you wind up buying. 
especially if you start doing vertical caving where it's like mountain climbing in reverse. Instead of climbing to the top, you're repelling on ropes to get down to the bottom. And then you have to climb those ropes out to, to leave the cave at the end. Ooh. Well, I already know I'm claustrophobic, but that sounds exciting. <laughs> Yeah, I, tried to get, I mentioned Margaret Wrinkle. I've tried to get her to go caving with me, and she just says, no way. She, she's not doing it. We're, we're just going to read your book and just feel from your beautiful writings, right? <laughs> so, Rob, I have a question for you. Uh, the question from the audience is, what's your favorite animal or bird, sighting, and why? Um, a lot of outdoors people who become avid birders are warbler freaks but i've always found warbler sightings to be better for people with more patience with binoculars because they're often flitting at the top of trees <laughs> I'm, I'm grabbing my field guide to to make sure did i remember the wing bar correctly or the coloring on the breast and all sort of thing so for me if i'm going to go for a bird it's going to be a pileated woodpecker it's okay. a great big yo ho hoing um sort of wild person of the uh of the bird world ripping off big chunks of bark to go after insects and trees you can hear its call from half mile away they're huge and they're striking uh looking and so um though i've seen two birds that aren't in the the book i was really glad to see the condor uh, and the red cockaded woodpecker, which is just in a few places around the country. It needs a certain kind of pine forest, which is pretty rare. Wow. But day to day, give me a woodpecker nest nearby <laughs> with the parents calling back and forth to the young, and I'm a happy camper. Oh. As, as someone who grew up watching the woodpecker, um, that's as close as I've ever gotten to a woodpecker. <laughs> <laughs> but I always thought that was kind of cool. And to know that there's so many and um, having special habitat for them is so exciting. Um, Ted, what's your favorite season and why? Well, I think it's fall, as I mentioned. Thank you. Uh, but but uh, I like all, all of the seasons Yeah. to get outside. And, uh, I, I, I love Rob's comment on the Pillar of Woodpecker. Uh, that's another really good piece of news. Yeah. In the 70s and 80s, you didn't see play of the They weren't around. And uh, in New Hampshire, we have a camp on this island. And you can't walk in that in the woods without hearing one or seeing one. Mm. Not too long ago, my wife and I saw seven together. I didn't know that they flocked like that. Apparently they do. So they're, they're coming back because of a lot of the Timber is, is, is being left and getting old, and that's what they depend on. Pillion woodpecker is one of the few birds, maybe the only bird, that its nest is destroyed. Mm. It will pick up its eggs and its beak and move with the eggs. Oh. Um, pretty fascinating. If you're out in the woods and you hear one, take a stick and bang it on a tree. And sometimes they'll respond and come in and see, see you know, <laughs> competition. Wow, that's so cool. I love the nuances that you all bring out in the natural world and just how if people just take the time to slow down and to notice that there is just this whole other world that we're missing all the time that's always been here and that we've sort of kind of like fallen to the wayside for us in our everyday lives. So I think that's a good segue into a question from one of the audience members. And it's what's the best way to both enjoy the natural environment, but also protect it? I'll, I'll start it. Uh, taking responsibility um, means while you want to put feeders up for birds to attract them, you want to know that birds can spread diseases. And so there is uh, a lot to know about how often to clean them and how to clean them and that sort of thing. And that's mm -hmm. the kind of responsibility that, you know, goes a long way toward both us being encouraging to wildlife and us being encouraging responsibility. It's to learn about invasive species, which mm -hmm. Michael brought up. Um, there are a lot of things that were not here when Europeans came to this continent 
that are here now and more that seem to come in all the time. Mm -hmm. And some of them uh, have no natural predators, nothing that eats them, and they will take over. I mean, you just have to look at kudzu. Yep. In for a world's fair. Yep. And here we go. Um, and so to learn that, you know, people who are environmentally conscious will say, I should be planting trees. And that's true in a general sense, but planting the wrong trees is just as destructive as mm -hmm. not planting any trees at all. Mm -hmm. And so it's just that combination of you follow your wonder, you get excited, you see what's out there, you learn everything, you get an expert. You know, it's not just going into a cave where you need an expert. You want to learn to be a bird. You want to learn a lot more quickly. Go to a, one of the local organizations that will take you out with a guide. You'll pick up things 10 times faster and you'll learn that combination of respect and responsibility. And, and be, a, be an advocate, but also be an activist. Mm -hmm. Appreciate the beauty and wonder of nature. Just, don't just drop it at that. Um, fight for, for, the, for the right things locally and, and nationally. Mm -hmm. Vote. Vote for Congress people who are going to defend the environment. Mm -hmm. Defend wildlife, wildlife advocates. Mm -hmm. uh, I agree with everything that Ted and Rob both have said. And the other thing I would add is that the greatest threat to wildlife and nature and, and, and caves as well is often uh, overdevelopment of land. And yeah. so support organizations that look to preserve habitat whether they're doing it in a, in a public way through expanding parks and wildlife areas or um, organizations like Audubon or the Nature Conservancy in the caving world. Besides the NSS, we have something called the S Southeast Cave uh, uh, Conservancy that buys up not only caves, but the surrounding watershed and land to protect all the wildlife on the surface, but protect the caves. Many caves, uh, after I started caving, they started closing for recreational ca uh, cavers. P uh, landowners who had caves on their property wow. became afraid from well-publicized deaths and accidents that someone was going to die in their cave mm -hmm. and sue them. So they just closed it to everybody. Mm -hmm. Well, these, these, this cave organization has, has uh, just cavers contributing, uh, have bought up a lot of these classic caves in the South. And now they preserve them for scientific study, for wildlife, and for visitation. And it's the same with other wildlife areas, wherever you happen to live. There are organizations that not only fight to, to protect the land, but also offer, offer programming where you could, you know, go on a hike with a naturalist, learn about the birds or, or the vegetation and all sorts of fun things. And it's just, you know, one great excuse to get out and have fun and learn at the same time. I love that. I love that. I said, I, I love to be outside. It's, it's one of the most beautiful things in the world. And I live 10 minutes from a state park. And the reason I bought this place was for that particular reason, so that I could go out more. The wonder of it all just makes me so excited. And that is what I try to share as much as possible when I go on hiking trips and uh, teaching out in the woods. What is one bit of wonder that you always, no matter how many years you've been outside, no matter how many times you've been in the cave, every single time just catches your breath. What can any of you tell me about that moment? Fireflies, period. <laughs> I, I can not imagine ever not being thrilled yeah. by seeing even one male firefly rise out of the grass and light up yeah it is if you were going to design in a science fiction novel something wondrous to take people to another planet to fireflies are all you need <laughs> if we didn't have them it would be a great science fiction story <laughs> i love that i love that michael what are I guess formations uh, not just the familiar stalactites and stalagmites but unusual formations like the lectites, which are little fingers of calcite reaching out into the air. Yeah. Uh, 
brimstone dams, you know, these natural dams deposited over thousands of years that make beautiful little reflecting pools. Uh, these are the things that make you stop and pull out your camera and just appreciate uh, the cave trip when you encounter them. And more and more, as someone who's interested in the life, we've learned that a lot of these, these formations, which are mineral and chemical, are associated with unique microbes that live in the cave system and slowly aid in the deposit of bright colors and unusual shapes. Uh, there's there's one cave in Mexico I've gone to where the stalactites wiggle like jelly and the cavers call them stalactites uh, because they're really microbial colonies. But if they stay there long enough, they harden into rock and, and become, you know, these preserved fossils for centuries. So, so that always makes me stop and stare when I'm underground. Wow. All right, Ted? Well, for me, uh, one of the most magical things in nature is a little tunny or false albacore. I'm, I'm an avid fisherman. I, I pursue them a lot. They are the uh, probably the strongest fish in the ocean in size and the worst tasting. They're absolutely vile. It's <laughs> great because nobody's killing them. <laughs> it's all catch and release, fun, and the, the population um, is, st is stable because of that. I'll just read you a couple sentences and I go on. Okay. The little tiny, aka false albacore. False is a terrible adjective for any species. A lot of false <laughs> species, false were wrong. But anyway, better to call them little tiny, or albies as we call them. They patrol tropical and subtropical waters on both sides of the Atlantic. When ocean temperatures peak in late summer, they stream north as far as Maine and Great Britain in shimmering elliptical schools that cover two miles on the long axis. Most people, even exper experienced anglers, think their bluefish are striped bass. Watch for the sickle tails and geysers of spray as these mini tunas swell bay anchovies and other baitfish. Often the schools are tended by a cloud of screaming terns and gulls that dip and dive leftovers. Few of these short-lived fast-going fish weigh more than 15 pounds. When they take your fly, they'll have 50 yards of line off you before you can snatch your booze, booze knuckles from the spinning handle. And now is the time that they appear in the, in the Northeast and the Atlantic. Fall, they move up. Nobody knows why, because they're not edible. Nobody studies them. <laughs> not, sure, not sure where they come from. They come north or they come in from out deep. Anyway, they're there now, and that's what I do when I get a day off. Uh, this all just makes me happy. When I go out, especially um, in, the, in the late summer and fall, it's been oh. mushrooms. There are so many beautiful mushrooms, uh, all different shapes and sizes and colors. And I even came upon a fairy ring not too long ago. And it was just like I was three years old all over again. And I was just waiting for you know my fairy to show up because I still believe in magic. And one is going to pop out and wave at me and take me to my happy place at some point in time. <laughs> I still believe. And I think that's what nature does for some of us. It still takes us back to that such a pure and happy state. Um, and it slows us so that we can enjoy all of that more. I find myself coming out of the forest um, and realizing I've been there for three hours. And it never feels like I've been gone that long. It feels like I just walked in. And so I want to share that. And I thank you all for sharing all of that and all of the stories um, in your books and your personalities. And I'm so sad that we're not together in person, but still, this has been magnificent. And I appreciate you all so very much for joining us um, on this session. Um, any last words? Because we are about to wrap up. We've got like two more minutes. This Meet has been your so children. Good. Get them out there. <laughs> leave, leave the house, turn off the phone, and find some nature. Yeah. Turn, turn off your iPhones. <laughs> turn off the iPhones, go outside, sit outside, walk outside, go underground every now and again, but with a guide, especially if it's your first time, because we want you to come back and report how awesome it was, right? <laughs> hey, guess what I saw? 
<laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Thank you all so, so very much. And um, I just appreciate you all being here. And once again, I want to thank everyone who attended and all the people who are going to watch this replay because this was awesome. Um, I want to remind everybody that the books can be purchased through the Parnassus link. Um, and that helps the authors, it helps the store, and it helps the festival. So thank you for attending. Um, and hope everybody gets to enjoy some outside time sooner than later. Yes, yes. Thank you, Nicole. Thank, Thank you, you Nicole. all. Thank you, everybody. Good to be with you guys. Yeah. Take care, um, everybody. All right. Have a good rest of your day. Thanks. Well, Bye.